Hello. Hello. Hi. Everyone. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Josh, it seems that uh, you're in the dark. Uh, I don't know if we can hear you. And uh, yes, you're you're back in the dark, but uh, maybe not. So yeah, welcome to this new episode of a Learn Live uh, with a special series about Microsoft Fabric working with data lake tables in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, my name is Christopher and I should be joined by Josh, but Josh has a little electricity issue at the moment. Uh, so I don't know, Josh, if you're uh, still here, maybe just in audio or uh, if we will do this alone, but uh, don't worry, I can go through the content uh, all around if uh, needed. Josh, if you can speak, uh, uh, do not hesitate to uh, uh, to take over at any time. Hey, Chris. Hi, Chris. Yes, I am here. Uh, just on audio, though, we just had a power outage in our neighborhood this evening, just before the session. But I'm excited to be going through today's land live session today, joined by Chris and also by our moderator, David Abu. So if today is your first time joining in a LAN live session, um, just note that today's session is part of a LAN module and you can follow along by going on to the link aka.ms slash LAN live 2023-09-12A or just scan the QR code on the screen. We would ask that you follow along so that you can be able to cover the same content as we'll be covering today uh, in this session. Also, just remember, this is a live and interactive session. David Abu is on chat uh, wherever you're joining us. So just say hi to him. Whatever questions you have, David will be able to respond on to them. And some of them might be thrown on to us here in the studio and we'll be able to respond to them. Chris, do you have anything to say about the ongoing Land Live series? Uh, absolutely, Josh. Uh, this uh, session today, is, and as you can see, it's live and we have uh, issues. Uh, this live session uh, is actually part of a service to help you get up and running with Microsoft Fabric, the new uh, unified analytics platform. Is already episode number three. Uh, we had two previous episodes. Uh, and as you can see on the screen, we have a few more episodes lined up. So do not hesitate to go on that link. Uh, I think we will copy paste it. Uh, in the chat as well uh, to register for the rest of the series uh, and to uh, get from zero to up and running uh, with Microsoft Fabric. Um, this Learn Live session uh, should be interactive and we will do a later on a little bit of uh, live exercise with you. Uh, each of this content, each of this session is uh, followed by a Microsoft Learn module. And maybe one of the greatest way to actually learn to do something is actually doing it. So do not hesitate to uh, join the Fabric Cloud Skill Challenge um, at ak.ms slash fabric dash CSC uh, to uh, go through all these uh, Microsoft Fabric Learn modules uh, to learn by yourself. Uh, you are already more than 600 students registered, and we can't wait to uh, uh, meet you there as well. Uh, to uh, get through these exercises, you will need to get access to uh, Microsoft Fabric. Uh, we made a great blog post to explain you how to get started with Microsoft Fabric, how to enable it uh, for your accounts, and you can uh, leverage the Fabric trial, a free trial, uh, to do all these exercises on all these learn modules. And we, I will show you later on during the exercises how I have enabled uh, Microsoft Fabric on my account. Uh, Josh, do you want to get started on the learning objectives for this course uh, for today and, and for the introduction? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. So. Uh, as part of today's session, we're going to understand uh, the Delta Lake and also the, del the Delta tables in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, we also create and manage uh, Delta tables using Spark. And uh, we'll also use Spark to query and transform del data in Delta tables. And finally, we'll use Delta tables with Spark structured streaming. And for all of these uh, particular objectives, we'll try and also cover them in a hands-on uh, exercise 
at the end of the session. So we're going to cover this uh, during the presentation and also dive um, into these particular objectives in the exercises. So without further ado, we can get started into the session. So what is the Delta Lake? So the Delta Lake is an open source storage layer that adds relational database capabilities um, to park-based data, data lake processing. So when you think of tables in, in a Microsoft Fabric Lake House, they are based on the Delta Lake table format that is commonly used in Apache Spark. So the Delta Lake itself is an open source uh, storage layer that will enable relational database capabilities such as transaction and schema enforcement for batch and streaming data while also harnessing the flexibility of Delta Lake, or sorry, of data lakes. Now, when you are in a Microsoft Fabric uh, Lake House, you can be able to identify, to easily identify a Delta Lake uh, by the triangular Delta icon next to their names. And Delta Lakes are the default storage format for tables in a lake house. The main advantages of using Delta Lake tables, sorry, the, the main advantages of using the Delta tables including include uh, relational tables that will support querying and data modification. So you can be able to use tools like Apache Spark to insert, update, and delete rows of data in Delta tables, just as you would in a relational database system. Another key advantage of using Delta Lake tables is data versioning and time travel. So Delta Lake will track multiple versions of each table and rows, and it will allow you to retrieve a previous version of a row in a query using the time travel feature. And we're going to see this in depth as we tackle the different exercises. The other key feature is that Delta Lake tables will also support batch and streaming data. So they can be used both as sinks and sources for streaming data through the Spark Structured Streaming API. And you can also use the SQL endpoint for Microsoft Fabric Lakehouse to also query data in Delta tables. As you can see on the, uh, on the second picture uh, on your screens, Delta tables um, actually are schema abstractions of a packet data files that are stored along with a Delta log folder that will contain transactions in details in JSON format. So when, when you look at the structure of a, of a Delta of a, of a Delta Lake table, you have an underlying packet uh, file which acts as your storage file. And you also have a Delta log folder that will contain the transaction details uh, in JSON format. Chris, do you mind talking more about the packet uh, file format and also the structure of the Delta Lake file. Sure. So uh, the Apache Parquet format is uh, an open source format, uh, but is a column store uh, format. So let's take a, a step back and uh, try to understand what is what are the differences uh, between these uh, file formats. Uh, the easiest one to understand is a raw uh, file format. Is basically if you have a CSV file it's a raw file format, which means that data is organized within the file by rows of information. And one row of information contains a record. Uh, in this case, uh, we have here a customer table. Uh, so basically, if we scan the file character by character, I will omit like the header, the first line. Uh, you will first get the first name of the first record, then the last name of the first record, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then at some point, you will get uh, to start to read as a second record with the same order of columns, like first name, last name, etc. This type of uh, data storage, which is used heavily in a lot of databases systems, uh, from CSV, Excel up to um, traditional databases like PostgreSQL or SQL Server, are great for a lot of different usages. But if you're doing analytical workloads, it's not the best way to store data because in an analytical workload, uh, you're not really interested in this discrete um, records, discrete rows. What you need to do is most of the time aggregating data over a large set of rows. For example, here, if you want to understand like all the customers with the same uh, last name or all the customers that are premium, uh, that kind of things, then we need actually to uh, read entire rows of data just to actually compute something on one column, like a sum or an average value. Uh, that's why we also have column-oriented formats, which are formats that stores data 
in columns. And here is a simplification of what happens if I try to convert this CSV file into a Parquet file. Uh, basically, what I got is uh, when I read the file from character to character, from byte to byte, I first get all the first names or of all the records in a row, in the same row, and then all the last name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which means that, for example, if I need to, uh, if I have an order table and I have a, a, a um, sales amount uh, column, if I want to do all the sum uh, to know how much I've sold in a specific uh, time, it's easy uh, because I just have to skip all of these lines uh, to go directly to the beginning of the category uh, row and then just read out all the character and do my sum uh, on top of that. I don't need to read all the data to actually get an information to the column. And then the parquet format also describes the structure of the data. Uh, so we have some metadata at the end of the parquet file uh, to understand like which columns are present in the parquet file, uh, where they start, they end, the type of data, etc. Uh, so that's a Primer, a very quick introduction to Apache Parquet, uh, which is important because, uh, as Josh said, uh, Parquet is the basis of Delta file format, uh, which is also an open source format. Um, and um, Delta is actually, uh, when we call a Delta table, uh, the physical implementation, the physical storage, if we open up the box, uh, a Delta table is actually just a folder. Uh, but a folder with a specific structure in it. Uh, you will find that all the data that is stored into a Delta table is actually stored in a series of parquet file, not just one parquet file, but a number of parquet file, as a number of files depend on a lot of, oops, sorry, uh, depend on a lot of factors. And then uh, you will have a Delta log directory that contains uh, the log files, uh, which is, which contains the transaction logs. And this transaction logs enable all the features just uh, Josh talked about, like time travel, ability to uh, create, update, delete, record uh, into the uh, file format, um, and a lot of other things. And basically, the log file contains each operations that has been done to that uh, Delta table, uh, which parquet file contains which operation, like which transaction in a way, and also some statistics um, about data. So it's helped uh, the Spark engine uh, to not read maybe 100,000 of parquet files, but to be able just by reading the log file to know where your data is. Uh, for example, if you have deleted an uh, entire set of rows uh, and you're, um, uh, you want to do a select on that table, uh, then uh, by reading the log files, you know that maybe parquet file number three and five um, contains only deleted rows, so you don't need to read this uh, parquet file anymore. Um, uh, we got a question live from uh, the audience, which is great. Um, does it mean that uh, Delta, uh, default means that only support Delta format? So uh, I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. Uh, if the question, so do not hesitate to rephrase the question in the chat if I don't answer properly. Um, if I understand the question as, does Delta only support Parquet file format? Uh, for now, yes, but it's um, something that will change. Um, big data world is evolving quite rapidly, and uh, we have a bunch of file formats coming up in a lot of directions. And right now, there is a work to uh, try to make, uh, even if all these open source, uh, these formats are open source, uh, we try to simplify it, uh, not we like Microsoft, but we the industry. Uh, so there are evolutions coming to the Delta format to uh, support more on the layering uh, format than Parquet and, and also uh, to try to support other type of format that uh, are close to Delta, but are not, uh, are not Delta. Um, so first thing to do uh, before you want to query a Delta table or um, insert data into Delta table is to actually create it. Uh, so Josh, if you're still here, can you walk us through how to create a Delta table? Oh no, it's me, sorry. Uh, it's me, so let's let's continue. Um, 
Yeah, so one of the things you need to understand, and actually I think uh, you need to pay attention for uh, the end of the session quiz, uh, is uh, how the delta tables are materialized. So we have something that we call the meta store or metadata store. These meta stores contain information about all the tables that are into the, the data lake, into the lake house. And the meta store contains where the files are, contains uh, some information about the files. We will uh, see this in a little bit more detail uh, during the exercise. Um, and where the file has stores. Uh, so basically, the meta store is like a catalog of all the delta tables uh, you have registered and are ready to be uh, used from Spark or from the SQL, uh, the SQL endpoint uh, for, uh, for Lakehouse. And actually, there is no one type of delta table, but there are two types of delta tables. Uh, the first one is managed tables, and the other one is external tables. By the way, I've shown you a few of these uh, uh, handwritten looking slides. These slides are called the fabric notes, uh, and uh, you can just go over to uh, aka.ms slash fabric notes um, to get a bunch of these drawings that explain Microsoft uh, fabric concepts uh, in hopefully a very uh, easy way. So let's back to manage tables and external tables. Uh, both of these tables are open Delta parquet format. Uh, so within the folder itself of the Delta tables, there is no differences between managed tables and external tables. As the main differences is how it's registered into the Metastore and how the Spark engine is actually responding to queries or to actions on these uh, different Delta tables. Uh, so um, locations, let's start by location, not by use case. We will uh, sum up by use case. Uh, when you're creating a, a managed table, uh, you're saying to Spark, to Fabric Spark, hey, I want to create a managed table. Please handle everything, including the storage. So all the data of that managed table will be stored into the tables directory of your lake house. Um, instead, when you're using an external table, uh, you need to have a place somewhere within the lake house to actually store the data. Uh, so you specify as a user or as a developer uh, you specify when you're creating the table, hey, please use that specific location to store that Delta table. Which means that uh, when you're applying some operation, like dropping a table, deleting a table, uh, there is a difference between managed tables and external tables. In managed tables, because it's managed, uh, when you delete the table, when you drop the table, uh, the deletion is entirely managed by Fabric Spark, which means that all the underlying data is deleted when you drop the table, uh, which is exactly what you got uh, if you are using a relational database. Uh, but if you are using an external table, uh, you're just when you're dropping a table, you are just deleting all the information in the meta store in that registry of Delta tables, which means that you retain all the data. Uh, of your external table. And if you want, later on, you can create, again, the same Delta table pointing to the same uh, storage location, and you would get, again, uh, the same Delta table. Um, in both cases, uh, you can integrate data from this Delta table with all the tools. Uh, within the Microsoft Fabric ecosystem is quite easy. Outside of the Microsoft Fabric Access system, uh, you can use the SQL endpoint uh, for the lake house uh, to access the data with any client or any tool that can uh, speak to a SQL uh, server. Uh, server. Um, and if you want to tap directly into the data table, in both cases, uh, it's um, uh, doable uh, through, uh, through APIs. Uh, so really what is differentiated between uh, these managed tables and extra tables is uh, the use case, how uh, you want to manage that table and, and which part of, uh, which component in, in your data is, uh, landscape is actually managing that table. Uh, if you want to fabric to be the single source of truth and management for that specific table, then you just have to create a managed table. It will be the case in like 95% of the time. 
But if in some cases, uh, let's say you're already using Databricks and Databricks is responsible for creating that data table and updating that data table, and you just want to use that data uh, from Microsoft Fabric uh, for reporting purposes, for example, uh, then uh, you will probably want to create an external table and let Databricks or let this other tool um, manage the life cycle of that uh, Delta table. Uh, long story to go back to how to actually create a table. Uh, and now we've made that distinction, it will be much more easier to see all the different options to create a Delta table uh, with, with Spark. Uh, basically, there is uh, two choices you need to make. As the first one is, uh, do you want to create a Delta table from existing data? Uh, or do you want to create a table from just a schema from uh, without any data? Uh, it's uh, In the second case, it could be useful if you need to set up the Delta table before setting up an ingestion process uh, that will fill up that data. Some uh, ingestion tools requires the Delta table to already exist uh, to be able to send, uh, to record data, uh, insert data into that table. And the second choice you need to make is uh, which language you do want to use. Uh, you can use uh, a SQL flavor called Spark SQL, or you can use uh, Python with uh, PySpark. And when you've done these choices, uh, you have here the different ways of inserting data, uh, creating a, sorry, creating delta table uh, with uh, Spark. Uh, as you can see, there is a subtle differences between the different columns, for example, for all the external table uh, options, uh, you need to actually specify a path uh, to this. So here I have a path in Python, here I have a location keyword in Spark SQL, uh, same here and same here. Uh, so it's it's several differences, um, uh, but here you have all the different solutions. So now we've seen how we can a create table. Uh, Josh, if you're still here and uh, still have some battery on, uh, can you uh, walk us through how to work with Delta table in Spark? Okay, so it seems uh, we don't have Josh anymore. Uh, so let's, uh, let's continue um, and wait for him uh, if he uh, get back online. Um, so one of the easiest way to um, work with uh, uh, Delta tables uh, is simply by using Spark SQL. Uh, so for this, uh, you you can create a notebook. Uh, we will see how to do it uh, during the exercise, uh, and you can just write the SQL query. Uh, here is a very simple SQL query that will update the products table uh, to uh, set a specific price um, in a, for all the rows having a specific product ID. Uh, so you can use, obviously, uh, a lot of uh, SQL constructs for doing this. Uh, you can select in one table and then uh, insert or merge uh, data into, uh, into another table. Uh, the other option for um, working with Delta table is uh, by using the Delta API. We do this mostly with Python, uh, even if uh, other languages could be supported. Uh, the main uh, used language in these cases is uh, is Python. Um, and here is um, a slightly different example uh, where uh, we are actually executing an update uh, type of query. Uh, we have a condition uh, which um, will be like, like the where uh, in the SQL. Here is uh, category equal accessories. Um, and then we have a new set condition, which is what uh, the new value is. And in this case, uh, we will reduce the price by 10% uh, by, by doing this. Uh, so it's um, if, if you want to try um, to use directly the Delta files, uh, it could be easier to do this. Uh, for doing this, you don't have to mount, uh, you don't have to register the Delta table uh, into the meta stores. Uh, as you can see, uh, you're uh, just like mounting in a way uh, the Delta table from the past. So that Delta table only exists in memory in your Python script. You will don't see it. If you do it just this, uh, you will not see it showing up in the Lakehouse Explorer. Uh, sometimes we create tables for like 
Um, during an ETL process, we create tables for temporary purposes. We don't really want them to mount them into uh, our lake house uh, and be easily accessible through the SQL endpoint uh, because it's like a temporary table. Uh, so in these cases, uh, it might be easier to uh, to use the Delta API. Uh, one of the cool features that you get uh, for free when using Delta table is table versioning, uh, which uh, means that each time you are executing a transaction, so each time you are inserting, updating, deleting any data onto a Delta table, then uh, the Delta framework automatically mm -hmm. creates a new version and all the version are saved uh, in a history. And you are able uh, to uh, go and look uh, uh, on all these different versions. So for example, here um, you have an example of uh, what's inside um this versioning um of, of table so as you can see uh you can see that the first version of the operation we call it a commit the first commit is a create table uh then we had a write uh, which is an append mode uh which means that we already add in this case we didn't add any data but when we do an append write which means we add data onto the existing data set um and here uh, we are updating the data um, so that's really useful for a lot of different cases. Uh, obviously, it's really, really useful in test scenarios uh, because you can still go back to a specific version uh, each time you're running a test. Uh, it's also very interesting if you are doing AI uh, because uh, when you are training AI models, uh, you're generating using your own uh, training data sets or your own data. And sometimes uh, when you have a a difference between two versions of a machine learning model, uh, the answer or why there is a such difference uh, resides in the data. So if you want to, for example, retrain a model uh, with a data at certain time in the past, certain point in time in the past, uh, you can use table versioning to read data as if you were reading in a specific date in the past. Uh, so there is um, just two examples uh, um, to show you how it could be useful to use features uh, like um, like time travel. Uh, we got a question from um, from Brett uh, online. Is there any way uh, to create tables in different schemas uh, or namespace, something like this? Um, for example, uh, bronze slash blah, silver slash blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, for now, no, it's not possible. Um, there is also some limitation in the Delta table names, uh, but that's something uh, we are working on. Uh, so um, uh, please, uh, yeah, I, I didn't uh, plan to see it, but actually it's a good thing. Um, let's go on um, community fabric. Microsoft.com, uh, which is a cool resource. Uh, so there is a ton of things on this uh, Fabric Community website. Uh, you got a forums if you want to exchange, have a question, etc. Uh, you got the IDs, um, uh, which is a website where you can submit product improvements and vote on uh, other ideas um, to get uh, something uh, added into the product. Um, and you got the, the Fabric blogs. And on the Fabric blogs, uh, each month, uh, we have a long blog post and a video about all the different news, all the different updates of all Fabric. Uh, and as you can see, uh, August has been busy uh, for the Fabric team. Uh, so do not hesitate to, um, to go to that blog uh, regularly to see uh, when we update things uh, like this. And go back to the slides. So um, from now on, uh, we've uh, seen how we can use uh, Delta tables with Spark, but uh, we're only considered uh, using kind of a static data. Uh, like I've, I had some product or I had some CSV, I loaded up into a Delta table, etc. cetera. Uh, that's a huge part of how Delta tables are used, uh, both with Fabric, with Spark, and Delta tables, 
uh, one thing you can do is to mix and match uh, what we called static or batch data, uh, which are data that moves maybe regularly, but uh, it's maybe like 100 uh, new items per second or uh, update qu uh, 100 queries per second. So it's kind of slow in a sense. And streaming data, where uh, when we talk about streaming data, we can have millions of new data uh, every second. Uh, and data tables allows you and Spark allows you to uh, work with streaming data. So let's look at uh, about this. Uh, we can do this by using something called uh, Spark Structure Streaming. Um, so a, a typical string um, processing solution is comprised of several parts. Uh, we have a source of data and we add a destination of data. And between them, we are doing some processing. And the processing could be really, really simple. It could be take the source data and store it uh, into the destination. Uh, for example, if you're uh, working for a bank, uh, you can have in a source a stream of events with all the credit card transactions mm -hmm. and just store it into a data table, and that's it. Uh, that's a very simple solution. A more advanced uh, streaming solution, obviously, during that job processing of each event, uh, you can do things like executing rules, uh, having uh, selecting a different destination based on your own criteria. Um, executing an AI or machine learning models uh, to do like fraud detections or a lot of different scenarios. Uh, how does it work with Spark Structured Streaming? Uh, well, Spark Structured Streaming uh, has an interesting model for um, uh, processing uh, and ingesting events. Uh, so you have an input data stream, uh, you will define that in code, we will see that in, uh, in the exercise, uh, but is consumed by Spark Streaming. And to help you as a developer having a, a simpler mental model, because it could be complicated to work on streams, uh, what Spark Streaming is doing is, is actually batching all the incoming events into small, small stream of data, uh, and then just executing a classic uh, Spark jobs. If you know Spark or if you have watched the previous episode of this uh, Fabric Learn Knife series, uh, you've learned about the data frame, uh, which is a representation of data. And basically, uh, what Spark Streaming offers us uh, is an um, append-only data frame. Uh, so as a developer, I'm just manipulating a data frame. That's it. Uh, and my code will be called upon and upon by the Spark Streaming engine uh, with batch of data. Uh, so it's a it's a small data uh, data frame that contains just the the, the events received uh, from a specific uh, period of time or from a specific uh, length of batch. Uh, and then I uh, manage this, uh, my event. I do my processing on it, and then I send it to uh, to the destination. So uh, we already covered. Um, um, what I call like the uh, theoretic, uh, theoretical portion of this um, of this learn life. Uh, do not hesitate to ask any more questions uh, into the into the chat. Uh, it's great. We already have a, a bunch of questions. Now we will switch uh, to the exercise part um, of the session. Uh, so let me uh, bring on my screen and actually. Um, right now, we can do uh, several things. Uh, you can sit back, relax, and watch me doing the exercise live, um, and um, and that's it. Uh, you can do this, uh, but also uh, get back to that Microsoft Learn modules um, and go to the exercise part and do it on your own after the show. Uh, or if you want, if you have the proper setup, maybe you have two screens, uh, you can have the live streaming on one screen and you can do the exercise uh, with me live uh, on uh, on the second screen. So it's up to you uh, to see if you want to follow along uh, or just uh, uh, watch and learn. Um, and by the way, um, everything I've said, like uh, the course of what I said is uh, uh, is here uh, in the in the informative sections of this learn module. So let's go to the exercise and launch it. 
And uh, what I've done, um, I, I told you before uh, that I've already enabled Microsoft Fabric uh, in my account. So let's see how I've done this. Um, I went to uh, fabric.microsoft.com and I've logged in uh, with my account. And I went to here into the settings portions and I've clicked on admin portal. And here you have um, an option which is user can create fabric items. And I made sure that is enabled uh, for me. Uh, sometimes uh, you will not be able to do it on your own because you need to have admin privileges uh, on, on your organization. So uh, for example, if you're working for a company, uh, you may not be um, um, a Microsoft Fabric or uh, be admin tenants. You might need to um, ask someone within your company to actually enable it for you. And uh, that's it. I wait like a few minutes. Um, and then um, if you're very new to Microsoft Fabric, uh, basically everything is organized around workspaces. So a workspace is like a Teams in Microsoft Teams or a, a project. Uh, and it seems that I'm also starting to lose power. Uh, one of my main light is off, uh, but you should be able to uh, see me right. Um, so yeah, so workspaces are a way to organize all your different projects, data, artifacts, etc. Uh, and what I've done to um, uh, enable, finish to enable Microsoft Fabric and actually start the Fabric trial, uh, which you can see here, it's enabled. Um, I, I just had to uh, create a new workspace and create a new item in it and, and automatically ask you to enable the Fabric trial. Uh, so let's follow along the exercise, uh, if you don't mind. And if you are using uh, Microsoft Edge, um, I will use uh, this uh, little options uh, split screen that allows me, uh, nope, uh, sorry, that's not in, yeah, come on here, here and here, yeah. Uh, so by using split screen, I can have the Microsoft Fabric interface in one part of my screen and uh, the Microsoft Learn modules uh, exercise um, in the other one. So I don't have to switch back and forth between, uh, between tabs. Uh, so let's go and, and start the exercise. So the first thing to do is to uh, sign in to Microsoft Fabric, which I've already done, and create a new workspace uh, for, uh, for that exercise. Uh, so let's do this. So I've already done that uh, before, but uh, let's create a new workspace uh, with you all. Uh, learn live. Uh, so you need to give it a name. The name is uh, unique to your organization. Uh, you might add a description. Um, I will uh, not talk about um, domain for now. It's uh, out of scope of this module. Uh, and you can add, if you want, an image. That's what I've done uh, there. And you click Apply, and the workspace will be created. It really takes like one second uh, to uh, to create a workspace. Um, and it should be empty, and that's, that's totally expected. Uh, so let's switch back to the workspace I've created before, uh, below live uh, Delta table. Um, now, uh, the next step into that exercise is to uh, create a lake house to store my data and to store my Delta table uh, and then upload some data uh, so I can I have something to work with uh, to create my Delta table. Um, and the first thing uh, you might want to do is to change the experience. So the experience is here. It's uh, this uh, little icon on the top uh, bottom left of the screen that allows you to switch uh, between uh, different experiences. Uh, as you can see, Power BI, Data Factory, uh, Data Engineering, etc., etc. And when you're doing this, uh, let's, for example, switch to Power BI. Uh, as you can see, if I click New, I can create a report, a scorecard, dashboard, etc. But if I'm switching to Data Engineering, uh, which is what we need uh, today, uh, then the interface changes a little bit and uh, show you some options that are more tailored to the type of task uh, you will need to do. Uh, so here, if I create a new, 
I have like the lake house, notebook, etc., which is exactly uh, what I need to do. So I switched to um, a data engineering uh, homepage um, and I will create a new lake house. Uh, so let's click here. I need to upgrade to Microsoft Fabric. Uh, it's done. Uh, very easy. Uh, I'm now in trial with this workspace because a trial needs to be applied to uh, any workspace you want to use with. Uh, and uh, let's call learn live uh, lake house. So I'm creating a new lake house. I just have to specify a name and it will uh, create data lake, a, a, a portion into a data lake. Uh, for me automatically. Uh, it takes um, really a few seconds. It's already created and loaded. And as you can see, uh, this lake house is organized into two sections, uh, the file sections and the table sections. And remember, I told you about this when we uh, talk about manage tables and external tables. Uh, okay, so now it's created. Uh, the next step is to um, download a data file. Uh, so it's a CSV file that contains uh, some products. Uh, it's just a sample data for, for us to work with. So I've already downloaded uh, this CSV file uh, on my computer, and now I need to upload it uh, into uh, my uh, newly created uh, lake house. Uh, so it's easy to do. Uh, we can do it uh, right within the web browser. And it asked me to uh, create a folder named products. So you can do it here with the three dots button, uh, new subfolder products. And uh, then you can click here again, click upload, upload files. And I will be able to pick up, up my products file and upload it. Uh, this way of doing things, doing it through um, uh, through a web interface, uh, is is mostly for one-off things. Uh, if you have to do this uh, like every day, for example, or on, on a schedule, or if you have to upload a very large file, it might be um, not the recommended way of doing it. Uh, you can download, for example, One Lake Explorer, uh, which allows you to. Uh, basically have access to your lake house as you have access today, uh, your OneDrive. So it adds a new thing, uh, a new item into uh, your Windows Explorer, uh, and you can drag and drop files and it will sync up automatically. Uh, and obviously we have things like data pipelines uh, if you have to move a large amount of data files. But like for this simple thing, or if you have like a, uh, a simple CSV file you want to upload, you can do it uh, right here. And, and for for the anecdote, uh, I've already uploaded a 10 gigabyte file uh, through the web UI, and it went very, very smooth. But uh, sometimes um, uh, it's not a recommended way of doing things uh, for, for production usage. So I have my product CSV file uploaded um, onto, uh, onto my lake house. I can preview the results. So as you can see, the exact same thing that uh, I have from uh, from that link. So it's, it seems that it's has been uh, uploaded well. Um, and uh, we will go through uh, the path of creating the data table with code. Uh, but actually, uh, if you just want to upload this file as a delta table and use it uh, directly, you can right click here, click load to tables and click new table. And it will automatically uh, launch a Spark job to import all the CSV file as a Delta table. Uh, that's a very easy way to do it, uh, but uh, we will uh, obviously see the hard way uh, to do it uh, right now. Okay, so uh, first thing we uh, we can do now uh, is um, export the data as a data frame. So what we can do uh, is uh, we can go here, open notebook, and uh, create a new uh, create a new notebook. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, we will need a few seconds to uh, get the notebook editing experience loaded up. Um, so that's it. Uh, it's loaded up, and as you can see, we can find again our our lake house here. Um, and if you don't know notebooks, uh, notebooks, it's uh, an easy way to uh, write code uh, for 
uh, that have wrangling and data uh, usage, uh, you basically have blocks. Uh, so you can add a lot of blocks. Uh, and you have two types of blocks. Uh, one is code blocks. So here is a Python block. And uh, here uh, you can add a markdown block, which allows you to um, add a bit of documentation uh, during your process. Um, so yeah, the first thing I uh, will do is to delete everything and go here, export product.csv, and we can just say load data uh, as a Spark. Uh, so it will automatically add uh, the right code uh, to load that data from a CSV as a Spark data frame. So that's it. Uh, um, and as you can see, I'm instructing Spark to read as a CSV file with the header. And here is a, the full path uh, to that file. Um, into into my one link. Uh, we will talk about pass a little bit later. Um, and what you will do here is I will just uh, click here and run cell. And if you're already already using Spark or Notebooks, um, you might be surprised by what I'm doing right now uh, because I've created a Notebook, I've clicked on Run, and I'm doing nothing else. And in a few seconds, boom, I have the results. I didn't create a Spark cluster. I didn't create uh, attach uh, my specific notebook to a Spark session or Spark cluster. Everything is handled by Microsoft Fabric. So basically, with Microsoft Fabric, you create a notebook, you click Run, and uh, we will automatically uh, create a Spark session on a Spark cluster for you, attach your current notebook to that session, and that's it. It's done. Uh, you need a few seconds, as you can see, a few seconds to launch the session uh, and then to execute your query. And now, uh, so it, it took like 14, uh, like, uh, 14 seconds total, including 10 seconds to actually um, um, getting attached to, uh, to a session. But now I am attached to a session. So all the subsequent code uh, blocks that I will execute, uh, we will execute much, much faster because I don't have this a 10 second delay uh, to attach to an existing session. Um, so as you can see, I know how your access to the data was, was in a CSV file. Uh, so my next step here is to create a Delta table from the data uh, within my uh, CSV file. Um, so one of the easiest ways to do it, and I show it uh, in uh, in the fabric notes, uh, is uh, simply using a data frame and saving that exact data frame as a delta table. Uh, it's great if you already have data and if the data is already uh, in the right format, like having the right columns and each column has the right data type. It might not be always the case, uh, and, and most of the time is not the case. Uh, so for this, uh, if you load the data for now as a Panda data frame, I will um, just do a, a little uh, segue here. Um, there is two type, there is several types of data frames. One of them is Pandas using the Pandas framework. And if you're using the Pandas framework, um, you can use a tool called a Data Wrangler uh, that allows you to uh, load uh, these data frames and do a lot of different um, operation of your data, uh, like uh, finding and replacing, changing the file format, uh, converting text, like having a, a specific text in all uppercase or lowercase, uh, really just by uh, selecting things. So even if you don't know how to write any Panda code, uh, you can uh, you can do it right here and then um, add the code to the, to the notebook. Uh, so it's, it's, I'm digressing here, uh, but uh, what I'm I uh, wanted to say is uh, this uh, save as table method is useful, but most of the time you will need to, to have a little bit of work uh, between just loading the source data and then saving into um, a Delta format. Uh, if you already know the parquet format, uh, one of the cool advantages of the Delta file format is it allows schema changes, which means that you can create a Delta table with a specific set of columns and then later on, add a new column to that existing de uh, Delta table. That's something you can do with uh, the Delta file format. 
Uh, so I have my data, and now uh, let's create a manage table. Uh, here. Uh, so it's very easy. I took my data frame and I will write it as a delta format. And I'm just specifying in the save as table uh, the name of the table. That's it. And this will create a managed table. Um, as you can see, I haven't. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. I need to re execute that. Um, I didn't need to specify any path uh, because the actual storage of that table will be handled by uh, Fabric Spark and, and not by me. Uh, so it could take a few seconds, a few minutes, depending on the size of the table. Um, and uh, within a few seconds now, uh, because it's, uh, it's a small table, uh, we should have this uh, done. And we can go back to our Lakehouse Explorer and uh, refresh the table sections. And now we have managed products. And if we expand that, you can see that in the managed products tables, we we find our different columns uh, we add in our CSV file. So product ID, product name, category, list price is the same thing. If you want to explore that data, you can, again, go here and load that data as a new Spark data frame, but it's connected to that Delta table. Or if you just want to look around, uh, you can go back to um, to the Lakehouse item. And if you click on the Manage Products tables, it, it takes a few seconds, uh, but then you will get access to a preview of the data uh, into, um, into that table. Uh, the time it takes to uh, show up here depends a lot of different factors uh, that are uh, outside of the scope of, uh, of this course. Uh, so here, I have my data, but this time as a table. Um, and if you remember, I show you how the Delta table was actually just a folder uh, with a specific structure. Uh, you can actually see that if you want. Uh, you just have to, um, on your table, uh, click the three dots button. And here, click on View Files. And here I have a view uh, on this uh, Delta table folder. As you can see, I have just for now, I just have one pocket file, and I have the Delta log uh, folder, which if I go into it, here are the log files. Uh, again, there is only one log for now, but um, each time I will execute a transaction, uh, which is uh, which modifies something, either the data, the schemas, property, etc., I will have a new JSON file uh, showing up there. So let's go back to our uh, notebook, uh, and this time we will use the exact same data frame uh, because it's still in uh, loaded up. But instead of uh, saving as a managed table, uh, we will now uh, create an external table. So uh, let's copy the code and explain it. Uh, and here I will uh, actually copy this. File API and execute this while I'm explaining uh, things. So the beginning of uh, the uh, code is exactly the same. Oh, yeah, sorry. I need to do the ABFS pass. Do -do -do. Here, five, six, nine products. Yeah, I think that was the error. So the beginning is, is exactly the same, df write for my delta, and the method is the same, uh, save as table. Uh, we need a table name, as uh, we need for the manage table. And as I say during my introduction, uh, we need now to provide a pass to the files. So if we uh, refresh uh, the Lakehouse Explorer for now, before executing that command, I had only one table. And in files, I had one directory product. But if I refresh both of them now, both refresh, I now have my external products table, which contain my data. And I also have the external products folder, 
containing again a bracket file and the delta log folder. Uh, so in that external table, uh, by specifying a path, uh, I instruct um, uh, Spark to actually store the information in the metal store, but I'm directing where the data should be stored and that I own the data. Uh, obviously, Spark can create new parquet files, can create new checkpoint files, uh, new log files, uh, but any deletions or um, any uh, uh, change operations are handled by me and not by Spark. Uh, so we've done this, uh, we've done this, and we've done this. Uh, so now, uh, so far, we just executed uh, some Python code. Uh, so let's execute some SQL code and actually look at the differences uh, in the meta store um, about these two different uh, type of tables. So the first one is, um, uh, the first thing we will do uh, with this line of code is to describe uh, the manage table we've created. And the describe uh, command will output all the columns uh, with some information about it. Uh, so for example, here uh, we see that the list price is considered as a string, uh, which is weird because if we, uh, let's look at the external products now. Uh, if we look at the data, or actually we can just look at the CSV. It uh, Yes, it's a string, but it's also, uh, 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 floating number. Uh, so one of the things we might want to do in a production environment is uh, when we are reading the CSV file, we are changing the type of a specific column before saving it to a, a tool data table. Uh, so go back to uh, the describe command. Uh, we have all the column informations, but we also have uh, more, uh, more metadata to it. Um, we can see that the data is not partitions. Uh, it's something we can do when we have a large volume of data. We are partitioning, for example, by uh, year, month, and, and, and day of month. Uh, but something uh, uh, that allows us to easily uh, scrap some part of data or uh, easily access some data. Um, and here in the detailed table information, we can see the location. Uh, so the location is actually a little bit uh, difficult to see, uh, especially because I'm uh, really, really zoomed out for uh, for this live. Uh, but uh, if we take a moment, uh, oh, it will it will take too much time. Uh, but basically, uh, if you look at this, um, I can uh, do this maybe code. Yeah. So well, that's that's the same thing. Uh, you can see that it's stored under the tables uh, root folder of the lake house. So it's everything is managed by uh, uh, by Spark. And if I execute uh, that second SQL query, where here I'm trying to describe the external table, uh, we will see two things. Uh, the first thing we will see is uh, the location uh, is, um, is different. If I go here and I copy the location, uh, you can see the location is under files directory and not tables. And the second thing we will see is uh, in the detailed table information, we can see property external equal truth, uh, which uh, instructs Spark that, for example, when you're dropping the table, you're not actually deleting uh, the data file. Okay, uh, so let's try this. Uh, let's do something uh, we should not do, uh, which is a scary thing, uh, dropping tables. Uh, so let's drop these two tables. And uh, no data results, it's, it's just a drop table, so it's uh, like there is no output to that command. But if I refresh uh, the tables, Obviously, both tables are deleted. But if I refresh files, then I still have external products. And if I open up this, you can see that uh, under the external products directory, I still have my pocket file and my data log. So all that is still uh, is still there. Uh, we show um, earlier how to create here how to create a delta table from an existing data frame. 
uh, in the next step of the exercise, uh, we will see how to create a table from SQL where you already have Delta table folder created with some data, uh, which is a case here because uh, as we can, uh, as we have seen uh, just before, uh, drop didn't affect the external table. So uh, the SQL command is really easy, uh, create table. Um, we need to specify using Delta and because we are specifying your location, uh, Spark SQL will know that we are trying to create an external table. So we execute that code, uh, which should take like one second to run. Yeah. Um, and if we refresh tables, then we have our products tables uh, up again. Um, let's do some select now. Um, and I should see uh, within a few seconds again, uh, my product data. So as you can see, when we drop table uh, that is external, data is still there, and it's really easy to mount it up again into the meta store uh, with the exact same data and without any data movement, any data creation, because the data is already existing uh, in uh, in the storage. So uh, one of the things I showed you uh, earlier um, um, I talk about is the table versioning. So it's actually the fact that any Delta table is version. So every time you insert your update data or delete the data into a Delta table, uh, things are saved and you can travel to time and history uh, to see the different versions. Uh, so uh, let's try to do this uh, with, with that external table. So I will execute a code uh, that will um, update uh, the list price uh, that will reduce by 10%. So list price for a specific category. Um, as you can see, I have affected 32 rows by executing that, um, uh, that command. Uh, so now what I can do is to um, first uh, have a view, like a bird view of the history um, of this table, simply by executing the command describe history. Uh, products. So here we go. Um, and here you can see uh, the version. Uh, so the version is just a, an, a number that incrementally grows. Uh, the timestamp of the operation, um, user ID and username uh, could be uh, could be set up in different ways. Which type of operation has been, exist has been uh, executed? Uh, and if there is any parameter, for example, here I have a predicate on, on the category, uh, so I know which category um, has been affected. Um, and then I can have uh, other type of informations uh, within that index. Uh, so that's cool. Uh, we get a history of index, uh, but uh, what will be cooler uh, will be to be able to travel back in time. Uh, and this is exactly what we can do uh, here by using the Delta API. So here I'm not using SQL, I'm using the Delta API to kind of look into that Delta table folder uh, directly. Um, and uh, you can do this really easily uh, with the Spark read um, uh, format. Um, and the load, um, the load uh, method uh, with the path of the Delta table um, and as you can see here, if I'm not specifying anything uh, special, I'm getting the latest version of the data, uh, which is something you will do with like any type of database. However, uh, you can use an option parameter here and specify a version. And here I'm specifying the version zero. And if I display the current data and the original data, um, and I have modified, I don't remember, mountain bikes. Uh, so yeah, uh, here is a mountain bike, for example. So the list price for the first, uh, the product 770, 71 was uh, 3,000 something. And uh, this is the same product as version one and version zero. Uh, so before my modification, and you can see the price was um, higher in the version zero than uh, the current version of the table. Uh, so what 
it's it's something that is really easy because at insert time you don't have to do anything to benefit from uh, time travel. You don't have to uh, specify a, like a save checkpoint or save data or save state uh, something. You just have to create to do your uh, your inset query or your update query. That's it. Uh, all this is handled uh, behind the scenes. Um, and with uh, the describe and uh, uh, load options, uh, you can easily retrieve the data at a um, at a point in time uh, which is uh, before uh, before today. Uh, great. I don't see any other questions, but do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat. Uh, we still have a bit of time together, um, and we have two things uh, remaining for this session. Uh, the first one I will kick off in a few seconds is uh, how do we use Delta Table for streaming data and not um, static or batch data? Uh, and then we will do a bit of knowledge check uh, and give you a few pointers to uh, continue your uh, learning journey. So do not hesitate to continue to ask questions directly into the chat. Uh, so last part of, um, of the exercise section is how to use Delta Table for uh, streaming data. So you know what? Uh, I will do something, and I will create a new notebook. Uh, so here, uh, I will uh, rename my notebook uh, with like create and work with delta. Uh, and if I want, I can share it, uh, for example, with Josh. Uh, he wasn't able to attend the entire session, but here I can just uh, just send an email. And what is cool with Microsoft Fabric is uh, the notebook is part of the Fabric workspace, uh, which means that it's already shared uh, with my teammates here, including Josh. Um, and you can comment on it uh, and review it like you would review a Word document. Uh, so that, that's great to share uh, work in progress with, uh, with team members. Um, so yeah, so let's go back here and create a new notebook. Uh, here we'll create a notebook for uh, streaming data. So here I will rename it to streaming data. And I will need to attach a lake house uh, that is already existing, uh, which is this one. So now I can start uh, work on something. Okay, so uh, the process for this um, this exercise. Let me switch to something I've done uh, in the past, a little uh, diagram, so you understand what we are going to do right now. Um, we, we will uh, simulate uh, streaming data by using only files, OK? So as a source, uh, as, I, as I explained, when you're working with um, uh, streaming jobs, you basically have an input, an output, and some processing in the middle. So in this case, the input will be a data folder. And each time we will create a new file in it, we will consider is, um, the new file contents as it's a new event to process. As the output, uh, we will output all the information we receive into a delta table so we can do some analysis uh, after uh, afterwards. Uh, so basically how it works, um, what we do is when a new file is created in a data folder, a Spark streaming job will kick in uh, processing this new file. Uh, and in, in that job uh, for each new file, we will load a file with a specific schema. It will be a JSON file. Uh, and we will save the new data in the, in the Delta table. That's it. So let's go uh, do this. Uh, so first, uh, we'll add a uh, long cell. Uh, and uh, while it's running and while I'm attaching to a new session, uh, so it will take like a, a 10, 10, 15 seconds to attach, oh, or a little bit less to attach to the session. Uh, what I'm doing here is a lot of different things, actually. Uh, the first thing I will do is I will create a new folder of files slash data. So if I refresh here, I will have my uh, data folder. This folder uh, is a folder I will watch uh, for new files. Uh, and it's it's my input source uh, for this uh, streaming job, OK? 
uh, then um, I have something uh, which is not related to setting up the environment, uh, which is uh, defining this, the JSON schema. So um, the type of uh, data I will find the input files. Uh, and I will uh, define um, a read stream by specifying a schema, some options, and um, a path. And then the last part is to uh, write the first set of data. So if I go here, uh, let me actually open up the Lakehouse Explorer again. If I go here in data, you can see that I have a beginning of a stream of uh, events here, OK? So that's the first step that is uh, mostly for setting up the environment uh, with, a, with a stream. In a real project, we will have a, an event hub, an event, uh, uh, event bus, a Kafka cluster, something like this, uh, where we will attach to, to uh, consume uh, incoming events. Uh, the next step uh, will be to actually describe um, uh, what we will do uh, with um, uh, with the stream, and what we are doing here uh, is uh, is really simple. Uh, we are just writing the input stream as a delta table uh, in a specific um, uh, delta table. That's it. Okay. So here I'm specifying the path because it's under tables. It will be a managed table. Okay. Um, and I need to for doing this kind of streaming uh, processing, I need to specify a checkpoint location. A checkpoint location is just a place where the streaming job can save how much uh, the processing job has done on the inputs. So let's say, for example, uh, in my data folder, I add, at a specific moment in time, 10 files. And when I'm processing file number two, for whatever reason, a bug or uh, network issue, etc. Uh, my um, job processing job goes down. Uh, then Fabric will relaunch that job, and this job needs to understand where it has stopped uh, before being cancelled or before uh, being um, stop executing. Uh, so the checkpoint file is, is just is, is a is a pointer into where into the input stream, how far we have processed uh, the the input stream. And uh, then we are calling the start method. And this is interesting uh, because I will launch the execution of that method. And as you can see, this code has done being executed. But something has, has changed, like something is running in the background. So uh, we can see this uh, in different ways. First, if I refresh, um, if I refresh my table, I can see that uh, I now have my IoT device data table. Um, and if I query it here, um, I will see uh, the different lines. So I should have, like, I think, nine lines uh, here. Yes, nine lines. Uh, so my job has kicked in and, and started to process the first the first file. So now uh, let's create a new cell. And uh, basically what I'm doing here is creating a new file uh, called more data uh, and, and saving it uh, into a table. And remember, I had previously nine lines uh, in, in my delta table. And now if I execute the select um, on that table, um, I will have more than uh, nine lines. Uh, it takes a few seconds to execute, uh, and we will see that we have uh, more than nine lines. Um, how it's done? It's because uh, Spark has actually started a processing job, uh, and here I will go a bit into details. But uh, you can actually, uh, if it's working, yes, um, you can actually access the Spark uh, dashboard. So if you know Spark. You have we have seen this, uh, and if I go here into streaming queries, you can see that um, I have started two minutes ago a streaming query, uh, and is is this background job? So because I've clicked on start, 
then uh, the job is processing and, and displaying some data. Uh, so now let's go back to my uh, work here and execute uh, this command that will stop, actually stop the, pro the streaming processing job. So the job is finished, uh, which means that if I create a new files, it will not be um, um, processed. So here I have 16 items. And if I execute here more data too, true. And if I do a select again, I will still have uh, 16 lines because the job is uh, a stop process. And if we can back here, and refresh that. The status of the job is finished. So my processing job is, is now uh, finished and I'm not streaming up uh, any more data. Uh, last step uh, for uh, this exercise is to clean up resources. Um, and you can easily clean up resources by going to your workspace, going here into workspace settings uh, clicking on other and clicking remove this workspace. It will delete everything uh, from your workspace and you're back to, uh, to square one. Okay, uh, we've done with the exercises. Uh, let's do a little uh, knowledge check. Uh, so for this, uh, I encourage you to snap this QR code or to uh, go to aka.ms slash polls uh, to get access to the poll um, and the producer, uh, she should be uh, displaying the poll in a, any minute now. Uh, while the poll is starting, um, let me go through uh, the first questions and um, the different answers. Uh, which of the following description best fits Delta Lake? Uh, answer A, uh, a Spark API for exploring data from a relational database into CSV file. Um, answer B, a relational storage layer for Spark that supports table based on parquet files. And answer C, a synchronization solution that replicates data between SQL Server and Spark. Uh, so I will uh, let you vote online again. You have the link uh, aka.ms slash polls or the QR code. Um, and I see a bunch of votes coming up. Uh, uh, we have a, a dozen of voters already, um, and it seems that one of the answer is clearly uh, clearly getting more votes. Uh, nobody yet has voted for uh, option A, uh, Spark API for exploring data from relational database into CSV files. Oh, oh one people has voted for option A. Um, so yes, uh, let's go to the answer now. And the answer is option B. Uh, yes, with a Spark API, you can load data into CSV file, uh, but it's not what uh, Delta Lake is about. Uh, it's not also a synchronization solution that replicates data between Spark and SQL Server. Okay, uh, you made it great. Like uh, almost all the attendees, all the voters uh, have uh, picked the right answer. So that's, uh, that's really great. Uh, question number two, uh, let's see if you're uh, as good as uh, uh, this question by the previous one. So question two, you've loaded a Spark data frame with data that you now want to use in a Delta table. What format should you use to write data frame to storage? And what I mean by this is, uh, you know, within the Python code, we need to uh, specifies a format, so which uh, value we put in that uh, specific method. Answer A, CSV. Answer B, Parquet. Answer C, Delta. Uh, so you already started to vote, uh, which is great. Uh, I will let uh, a few seconds, few more seconds for voters to uh, to vote. Um, Again, the answer we are looking for is uh, what we are putting into the format method uh, in the in the save um, method of the data frame. Um, and what are coming up uh, again? Uh, it's interesting. Is uh, 
it's much more divided than the first uh, answer. We got um, nobody voting for CSV and some people voting for Parkett and most of the people uh, voting for uh, Delta. So let's see what is the good answer. And the correct answer is C, Delta. Uh, congrats to all the voters. We have uh, selected this. Nobody selected CSV, uh, so that's great. A few people selected Parquet, so let's let's explain here uh, why we didn't choose Parquet. Uh, what I, let me go back to actually, actually the demo. Uh, what we were looking at is what we are specifying here. Here we were looking at this. Okay, we are looking at as a parameter of the format method on the right command. Here, you can type Parquet. It, it will work, okay? But what this will do is it will save the entire data frame as a single Parquet file uh, within a, a, the files directory. So here, uh, we will need to, uh, on the save, we'll need to specify a pass. Um, and by doing this, uh, the Parquet files are basically um, either append only or either um, uh, fixed. Okay, so uh, by using this, uh, you will store the data into a parquet file, a unique file. You will not benefit from all the advantages of the Delta file format, like time travel, acid transaction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in a sense, you are right. We are saving into a parquet file format, but we are doing things around that file format, and this is what is Borke. Um, now it's time to switch to uh, the last question of this quiz. Uh, you have managed you have managed table based on a folder that contains data file in a Delta format. If you drop the table, what happens? And before going to the answers, if you pay attention, you should know because I've explained it with the fabric notes and I've showed it. Uh, during the exercise. Uh, so let's vote now. Uh, what are the three uh, possible answers? Answer A, the table metadata and data files are deleted. Everything is deleted uh, with a managed table. Or the answer B, the table definition is removed from the meta store, but the data files remain intact. Option C, the table definition remains intact in the meta store but the data files are deleted. So again, I will let you vote, uh, and I see the votes coming in. Again, uh, some people have, like, uh, we have votes for the three answers. Uh, so we will, uh, we had a few seconds uh, more to vote, and I wanna, now I will explain the differences uh, because we have people voting for uh, all of the different answers. And uh, unfortunately, only one is correct. So let's see which one is correct. And the correct answer is, uh, oh, where is my clicker? It's here, sorry for that. Boom, laser pointer, disable. And the correct answer is answer A. When you are using a managed table, everything both the metadata and the data file are handled by Fabric Spork. So when you drop that table, everything is getting deleted. Uh, for the table definition to be removed from the meta store, but the data files remaining intact, what you need to do is to actually, in the first place, not create a managed table, but create an external table. When you're dropping an external table, uh, the table definition is removed from the data store, but the data files remain intact. Uh, for answer C, it's a bit more complex. Uh, table definition remains intact in the meta store, but the data files are deleted. Uh, you, it, it's kind of complicated to achieve this. Uh, the closest way to achieve something like this is to truncate the table, which means removing all the rows of the table. But when you're doing this with Delta table, because of time travel, you're not deleting any data file. What you're doing is actually saying to the uh, to the log file, hey, 
act as if there is no data file present, but they are still here. Okay, so I hope this explanation helps to uh, clear um, clear the different options here for people who have not answered uh, with uh, answer A. Uh, we are uh, reaching the end of the live session. Uh, thank you all for uh, being still there. Uh, let's go to a quick summary and some more resources uh, to uh, help you in your learning journey. Uh, so in this Learn Live session, we've seen uh, um, what is the data lake and delta tables in Microsoft Fabric. We've seen how to create and manage delta tables using Spork. I didn't mention it, but uh, you can use delta tables with other engine than Spork uh, with Microsoft Fabric. Um, but it's out of scope uh, of this specific uh, learn session. Uh, we've seen how to use Spark to query and transform data in Delta tables. And in the end, we've seen how we can use Delta table with Spark structure streaming. Uh, if you want to learn more about Delta Lake, uh, you have the link here uh, to access the Delta Lake documentation. Um, and if you don't have time to grab a screenshot of this, do not worry, you will have access to the recording of that session. So you can skip to the end and uh, get this link uh, later on. Um, as I said uh, before starting the exercise, uh, you can go ahead and um, do this exercise by yourself. Uh, do not hesitate to go to that link to get access to this uh, Microsoft Learn module we've seen during this uh, Learn Live sessions. Uh, during the introduction, uh, we said that this session is part of a series, uh, the Microsoft Fabric Learn Live series. We are only at episode three of the series, so don't miss the other episodes. Uh, the next one is next Tuesday uh, about data factory pipelines in Microsoft Fabric. Uh, you can register uh, here on that link, um, and we have many more sessions planned through September and also October. Uh, well, we reach uh, the end of our presentation. Um, uh, before uh, leaving you, if you have any last minute question, that's a moment to ask it. Uh, if not, uh, you can find uh, me and also Josh. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh. We hope Josh will recover from uh, his electricity situation. Uh, but do not hesitate to ping me on LinkedIn uh, or Twitter or, or Josh uh, if you have um, any more questions. Uh, you can also go back to the Fabric community I showed you uh, during this learn line, uh, which is at uh, community.fabric.microsoft.com. Uh, you will see a forum uh, to get your question answered. You can look at the user groups uh, that are uh, near your location. Uh, so that's also a great way to uh, meet new people and uh, continue your learning journey uh, with uh, Microsoft Fabric. Um, same as there is uh, no more questions and we are uh, reaching the end of the session. Uh, so again, thank you very much for attending this Learn Live session. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, even if for once it was only one speaker and uh, not an active discussion between two speakers. Um, I hope you, uh, you learn a few interesting things and you like that format, uh, even if uh, I was only one uh, speaking here. Uh, have a good day or have a good evening, depending on where you are on the planet, and see you very soon on the next uh, Learn Live episode.